Okay, so today's discussion is on price controls. And I'm really just going to be treating price controls as an extension of our equilibrium discussion. So uh, the authors go into much, much more detail uh, on the topic of, of price controls. And they do some really, really interesting analyses and, and examples. But for our purposes, we're just going to really touch on some of the basics of, of price controls, just so it can kind of illuminate our understanding of how the market mechanism works and how it can potentially be disrupted by, by uh, government interventions, for, for good or for bad. Uh, so real brief, the objectives of, of this lecture are to touch on uh, the two major, really the only two forms of price controls that we're ever going to discuss, price ceilings and price floors, their immediate consequences, uh, sustained shortages on the price ceiling side, sustained surpluses on the price floor side, and then deadweight loss is something that is going to result directly out of those surpluses and shortages. And we'll, and we'll discuss how that uh, impacts both uh, producer and consumer. Uh, when talking about price controls, again, when we're focusing on price floors and price ceilings, we can think of price floors as a lower bound that the government imposes on market price. So think of a price floor as the floor of a room. You cannot go below the floor of a room. Similarly, price floors do not allow you to legally engage in trade at prices below what the floor has been set at. Uh, price ceilings, using the room analogy, are like the ceiling of a, of a room. You, can, you cannot legally uh, engage in trade at prices above what the price ceiling has been set at. Uh, to kind of get a feel for how price ceilings and price floors influence the economy, you start out uh, at an equilibrium case where we have P star and Q star, and there's no shortage of surplus. So buyer and seller are both demanding and selling uh, Q star units at a price of P star. And then for the price ceiling case, we're going to assume that the price ceiling, which I abbreviate as, as, as PC, is set below P star. Now, if the ceiling is set above P star, it has no effect. The market's going to clear just as it did in the previous equilibrium lecture. So we're only going to focus on the case where it really has an effect. So we're, and that's uh, when we have an effective price ceiling, which must be set below P star. Okay, uh, an example of, of price ceilings that we have in the city of Chicago, like a lot of American cities, is on uh, cab fares. So you know, cabbies cannot legally uh, set their fares uh, at any price they want. They have to set their fares within the limits as, uh, as dictated by the city of Chicago. And there are lots of consequences of a price uh, ceiling, many of which come right out of the presence of a shortage. And again, for the purpose of, of, of time, we'll only be focusing on the sustained shortages and the lost gains from trade. Uh, the reduced product quality, the increased search costs, and the misallocation of resources, all very, very interesting, but uh, topics we will not be really getting into uh, at this time. So, uh, to look at the, the, the shortages uh, that result, you know, look at, at the price ceiling. Uh, it's below P star, so quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied. So there's a clearly a shortage that, 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 that's going to result. But unlike the case from last class, where a shortage was quickly remedied by, by, by bidding up prices, they're no longer able to, to really do that, at least not legally in this case. So they can't really signal to the market that they want, and because consumers can't really bid up price, the shortage kind of stays where it is, and it's sustained. And the primary result of a sustained shortage is that there's going to be deadweight loss, loss gains from trade for both the buyer and the seller uh, when the supply and demand curves look the way that they do here. So to kind of get a feel for this, again, look at, a, at an equilibrium case where you have this blue triangle measuring the consumer surplus, the green triangle measuring the producer surplus, Together, those measure the, the total gains of trade in, in the marketplace, in, in society. Now, when we have a sustained, as a result of the price ceiling, we have this shortage, and quantity supply is going to be our limiting factor here. So it doesn't really matter how much quantity demand it actually is. Quantity supplied is going to determine how many units get, get bought and sold. And because that quantity supply is actually less than Q star, we see that the market loses the ability to trade in those units in between QS and Q star that it otherwise was able to trade in in the free market case right here. And this 
larger triangle that's both gray and pink represents the loss gains from trade that result from the inability of buyers and sellers to be able to engage in trade uh, in those intermediate quantities. So this, 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 this gray triangle reflects the loss gains from trade that buyers incur when they're not able to purchase those intermediate quantities at the price of P star, at that low price of P star. And the pink triangle reflects the loss gains in trade on the seller side due to the fact that they cannot engage in those transactions uh, at a relatively high price of P star. Now, this, so together, the gray plus the pink measure the loss gains in trade for the market as a whole. Consumers might actually end up being better off in this case. They do get the ability to consume them at a relatively low price. But their gains are just offset by the losses to producers. So this, tri this rectangle right here that kind of is in between Q prime, uh, uh, P prime and, P, uh, and PC and zero and, P, uh, and, and QS, this rectangle right here reflects a transfer of welfare from sellers to consumers. So this is you know, this explains why a lot of consumers actually like price ceilings because yeah, who are lucky enough to consume this commodity are going to get to do so at a relatively low price. Um, that's that's good for them. It's it's not good for the sellers who are selling it, but they'll still sell it because they still get some sort of surplus, just less than they, than they did before. But still, on net, society loses because of these loss gains. Uh, price floors are just the opposite of a price ceiling. Now we have a minimum bound on what prices can be set at uh, in the marketplace. You know, classic example of a, of a price floor in the you know, modern American economy would be uh, the minimum wage or agricultural price floors. Starting from a case of, of, of equilibrium, we can see what the consequences of an effective price floor are by looking at a price floor that's set above P star. A price floor below P star is not going to have an impact. Only prices above P star, price floors above P star will have a real impact on the economy. Now, as you can tell, at this price floor PF, the quantity supplied is, is way out here, and the quantity demanded is, 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 is now relatively low. So there, there, there's, there's going to be a surplus. Okay. Now, in addition to the surplus, there's going to be lots of other consequences, such as increased product quality that result, also some sort of misallocation of resources, and loss gains in trade. We'll really focus on the first two for the, uh, for the sake of time. Um, the surplus that we see that results from a price floor is also going to be a sustained surplus. This is because, whereas in the uninhibited case, a surplus is quickly remedied by sellers outbidding one another by pushing down prices. Now they can't do that. Okay? Sellers can't legally sell their commodity, and buyers can't legally buy the commodity for a price below PF. So even though a lot of dissatisfied sellers have an incentive to bid down their price as a, as a means of you know, increasing the chance that they sell their, their, their output, they can't legally do so. So there's going to be a sustained surplus uh, for as long as, as this price floor uh, is, is uh, above P star. Okay. Now, what does that do? Again, that means that quantity demanded is now our limiting factor. So again, it doesn't really matter how much quantity supplied is. We're only going to trade as many units as quantity demanded is, because quantity demanded is, 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 is less than quantity supplied. So again, as you can see, uh, this is very, very similar to the previous case with, with, the, with the price ceiling. We lose the ability to engage in trade in those, uh, in those commodities in between QD and Q star are being uh, right here. And again, now what's going on is, is you know, we, we, there are lost gains from trade to consumers because they lose the ability to consume this commodity at a relatively low price. And there are lost gains from trade for, for sellers because they lose the ability to uh, produce this commodity at a relatively high price. And again, there's a transfer. But, but in this case, because the price floor is intended to help sellers, we see that, that the transfer actually flows from consumers to sellers. Those sellers who are lucky enough to sell uh, their commodities in this marketplace are going to get to do so at a relatively high price, whereas consumers are gonna, who, are, who remain in the market are going to buy at relatively high prices. So some of that uh, lost uh, consumer surplus 
is just transferred to sellers in the, in the form of, of increased producer surplus. But there's really, on net, no real gain to society. Uh, in fact, on net, there's actually a, a loss to society. And, and, and that's really it. And 